you talked about meditation earlier. Can you explain exactly how that became a part of what you do and what sort of meditation are you talking about? There's obviously okay. different forms out there. Many forms. Now, one, one of the things that is very important in people learning to meditate is that it has to be effortless if it's going to be the most effective. Uh, and effortless, the two, the two most effortless forms of meditation that I know of that are highly efficacious are just simply putting your attention on your breath or the mental repetition of a sound like a mantra. As soon as you put your attention on your breath, or you start to repeat a mantra in an effortless way without trying to control thoughts, without pushing thoughts out of your mind, without in, indeed without uh, letting thoughts just be a natural background to what you're doing in the same way that clouds floating by in the sky would be. You just accept them as they are. And then you think the mantra or hold your attention on your breath. From time to time, your attention will slip away. You'll start thinking about something else or your attention will be drawn to an external noise, something like that. And you realize that your attention is no longer on your breath or you're no longer thinking the mantra. And what you then do is you gently, effortlessly bring your attention back to the breath or in an easy, lazy, effortless way, you start to think the mantra again. But when you do that, you don't try to push out whatever thoughts are there. You let the thoughts continue to flow. So the whole process is effortless, but what happens is your breathing starts to become very quiet and very soft. And the softer and quieter your breathing gets, the more your body becomes relaxed and the more your mind starts to quiet down. So most people's minds are kind of going like this all the time. What did I, did I feed the cat? What do I have to do today? What's on my list for shopping? What's on my list at work? You know, all this kind of stuff. And you find that all that starts to quiet down. Uh, so the, the softening of the breath, the relaxation of the body, and the mind quieting down. And as well as that, of course, the science is very interested in this now. The neuroscience of, of meditation is very, very extensive. The, in fact, I can't even keep up with the field anymore. So major changes in your blood chemistry that take place as a result of that, changes in the actual structure and function of the brain. Um, for example, the brain is made up of of three layers. Uh, they've emerged biologically with evolution. So um, the first layer of the brain is called the primitive brain, sometimes called the reptilian brain. Um, it sits on top of the brain stem. It doesn't have two hemispheres, but it's responsible for autonomic functions like breathing and heart rate and stuff like that, and also for the basic fight, flight, flee response. Um, by the time reptiles roamed the earth, uh, that brain was fully formed. So sometimes it's actually called the reptilian brain. Um, the second layer of the brain really emerged as mammals uh, emerged, and it's called the limbic system. The limbic system is much more involved in emotional life. In fact, if you, if you look at a reptile and you look in their eyes, you don't really see anything there because there's no emotion. You look at a dog or you know, a mammal, and you see something there because you're, there's, there's emotional content because they have that part of, the, uh, of their brain. Um, but located at the center of, the, uh, of this and at the bottom part of the limbic system, there's a little almond-shaped part of the brain called the amygdala. Now, the amygdala is something that we were, uh, that, that in evolutionary history has had a specific purpose. It's an early warning system about dangers in the environment. So in the past, 20,000 years ago, it might have been, uh, you know, being aware of there's a saber-toothed mm -hmm. tiger uh, in the area. Now, of course, it's attuned to the things that cause us stress in our environment. So it might be a difficult boss, a difficult employee, a problem we're having at work, uh, you know, the possibility of losing our job, um, a financial crisis, you know, whatever it might be. But all these various kinds of fears, they keep the amygdala part of the brain often in a, great, a very large percentage of the population overactive. And as it becomes overactive, people become more hair-trigger responsive. So when things happen in their environment, they respond in stressful ways that don't usually have an effective outcome. It's like being on a treadmill. They keep doing the same things over and over again um, that are, is meant to handle the situation and, in fact, only complicates it. And most people know, are familiar with this. They know that they do certain things when they're in stressful situations that probably won't have a good effect but they find themselves doing it anyway. Um, so um, one, one of the things about meditation is that it, it helps to calm down that part of the brain. 
And if you're taking supplements in addition, the supplements have a, a nurturing effect on, on the brain that complements very much what meditation does. Uh, studies have shown that when people have been doing this regularly, uh, the amygdala actually shrinks in size. And if you look at it uh, with an fMRI scan, you'll see that it doesn't light up to the same degree that it used to, and that means that it's, it's calmer. So the panic button part of the brain is actually uh, uh, calmer. Uh, every day the brain produces approximately uh, 10,000 new stem cells. Uh, half of those become mother cells that create the next 10,000 the next day. But 5,000 of them or so go to the part of the brain which is most active and most used. So if people are under a lot of stress, it goes to that part of the brain, which we call the amygdala, and it makes it larger and it lights up more. But when people have gone through this process of meditation, they've been using nutritional supplements so that their, their nutrition is at its, at its optimal state, um, the shrinking of the amygdala is measurable. That is, using fMRI scans, they have shown there is a definite shrinking of the size of the amygdala and it doesn't light up in the same way. Um, the third layer of the brain we call, is the, what we call the cerebral cortex. It's responsible for the higher mental functions. And in particular, the two frontal lobes have a lot to do with emotion and emotional regulation. So for example, people who are habitually stressed or anxious, uh, there'll be a lot of activity in fMRI scans in the left prefrontal, oh, sorry, the right prefrontal lobe and the left prefrontal lobe will be fairly quiet. Uh, when people have had the right kind of nutrition and have been meditating for a period of time, something starts to reverse. The first I mentioned is the shrinkage of the amygdala and, and the fact that it doesn't light up as much. But also, the left prefrontal lobe starts to quiet down, and the, the, the right rather, and the left one lights up. Now, when the left prefrontal lobe is, is lit, the person is in a resilient, active, ready-to-take-action state. They're focused, and they have that quality of being able to stay focused over a period of time. So it's perfect for someone who's, who wants to get into action and to be as effective as possible in action. This is probably one of the reasons why uh, uh, meditation and mindfulness, for example, is being widely used now in large corporations. Places like Apple and uh, Amazon and Facebook and uh, uh, Johnson & Johnson, Unilever, all of these companies, um, uh, it's very, very widely used. Now, in my mind, the nutritional aspect of this is, is equally important. So the meditation is important, but uh, there are a whole number of micronutrients that the brain needs. And unless you're taking a really good supplement, as I said, I've had to draw that from many different sources, you're not going to get those. And again, this is going to mean that you're, you're less likely to have a brain that's functioning at its, maximally, uh, at its maximal effectiveness. Mm -hmm. um, and what could be more important than that? I mean, it's, it's our navigator, if you like, through life is, is our brain. We talked about meditation and how beneficial that can be for stress. Yeah. A lot of people say, that's great. I don't have time to, to do that. What do you tell people? You teach it a lot. What do you tell people that can at least get them started down the road? What you're saying is you don't have time to do something which will reorganize the way your brain and your mind works so that, in fact, you will find you have more time. <laughs> and it's true. Um, actual scientific studies have shown that people who meditate regularly have a better way of organizing their time. And if things come up that are unexpected, they're able to work that in weave that into the fabric of their day more easily and more efficiently and effectively. So in fact, people wind up actually having more time as a result of taking 20 minutes a day to meditate. And I've seen this happen, uh, a number of executives, for example, that I've worked with that were hyperactive and hyper busy. I mean, these were the kind of people that were working 16 hours a day and literally said there's no way that they could work like 20 minutes in, of their day into doing something like this and discovered after maybe several months of doing this that in fact their working hours had shrunk by, two or th by, by maybe two, as much as two or three hours of time simply because they were organizing their time in, in different ways and they were also making finer discriminations about what was really important and what in fact could be put on the back burner. If you're really busy and you have a, a job that involves making a lot of decisions that's what you have to be good at, is knowing 
what can be on the back burner and what has to have priority, what's important and what is um, of, of critical importance and needs to be dealt with now. And organizing your day and organizing your time, that's a function of the way your brain is functioning. That, that results from the way your brain is functioning. So having a brain that functions far more efficiently, okay, where the three layers of the brain are, are working together rather than against each other, um, that becomes critically important and make, it makes a huge difference in the way you use your time. One of the stories that, that you were telling us earlier that I thought was interesting is uh, through meditation you can train your brain to, to see situations and, and react differently than you normally would yes. where the, yes. you mentioned they show the um, video of, of children being harmed in some way. Just talk about that and how we can train our brain to deal with situations differently. Okay. Um, now, uh, one of the things that, that anyone would find generally find stressful is to look at a picture of a child that's suffering. Mm -hmm. And what they've discovered in people who, um, who practice meditation regularly uh, is that they will see a video or a picture of a child in that situation and at the same time they'll be doing an fMRI scan of someone who doesn't have that background of uh, practicing meditation. Now the person who doesn't have that background, you'll find that the amygdala, the part of their brain which is which reacts to stress, lights up very bright, as does the right prefrontal lobe. And in that circumstance, they're feeling so upset by what they're seeing that they're completely ineffective in terms of being able to intervene and do something. Uh, what they're finding in people who are regular practicing meditators, and this has to be over a period of time, is they'll see the same situation, the child suffering, and what will happen is the amygdala, the part of the brain that that normally shows a stress reaction, and the right hemisphere of the brain will remain very quiet, showing that the person at that point is not actually upset. But what will happen is the left prefrontal lobe will light up, showing that they're focused and ready to take action, to actually take some action that might make a difference uh, in this case. Now, obviously, they, this is an experiment, and they couldn't intervene to do something for the child, but it shows that their brain is in that state where if there were something they could do, it would be in the right state to do something and they wouldn't be so upset that they couldn't effectively intervene. So um, people who are trained uh, in, to, to meditate regularly, uh, one of my first teachers told me this, and I've always remembered this, he said, when you see suffering or problems in the world, uh, see, see the problem or the suffering and be clear what it is. Go in and do what you can in the most effective way to help alleviate the problem or help alleviate the suffering, but don't get involved in the suffering. In other words, if you're now suffering, then you're not effective right. in helping to overcome the suffering or the problem that's out there. I want to touch on meditation briefly again. One thing you mentioned earlier was that there are certainly different kinds, mantra yep. and breath. What are, what are some of the differences between different meditation forms. Okay. Now, there are some forms of meditation where there's a lot of emphasis on controlling your mind and a lot of emphasis, for, for example, uh, Tibetan Buddhist meditation places a lot of emphasis on controlling your mind and uh, being able to be what they call one-pointed. Uh, this is really difficult work and it means sitting in, in very specific postures with your back very straight and so forth. There's a lot of effort that's involved in that. Now, over many years, if people stay true to those, uh, to those techniques, they still do gain a lot of benefit. But what I've found from, from my 40 years, literally 40 years of experience of both teaching meditation and trying various forms of meditation is that meditations that are effortless and that don't involve any kind of posture work much faster and are much more effective than the ones that are difficult uh, and, and uh, r really hard to do. So uh, I mentioned that the other one other than mantra meditation is just simply meditating on your breath. And so in the same way as in mantra meditation, you would just put your attention gently on your breath, never interfering with thoughts, just letting thoughts flow through your mind. From time to time, your attention will drift away from your breath uh, onto some thoughts or you'll hear some noises or something like that and you'll recognize your attention isn't on your breath, you just gently bring it back again. But those types of meditation that are effortless, and the two I found that are the easiest to teach and the easiest to learn are mantra and breath meditation, they pay dividends where within three weeks, like I mentioned myself, all my stress symptoms 
disappeared three weeks, literally, after I started practicing regular meditation every day. If I had been doing one of those really difficult forms of meditation, such as uh, the Tibetan Buddhist type of meditation, it would have taken much, much longer uh, to achieve those, those kind of results. And, and the whole trip would have been a much more difficult uh, trip.